out of nothing. So living within the bowels of the global pandemic has been odious. We have been assaulted by various articulations of trauma spilling out into all aspects of our lives. There has been a persistent cadence to the grief and the loneliness and the fear and the vulnerability that we have had to face every day on every front of our lives. But within the midst of all the cries, in the midst of the grief that we have expressed for loved ones who we have lost this year, in the midst of the groans of loneliness and the, the desperate aloneness that comes with missing rituals like church and family gatherings and social gatherings, in the midst of all of that, there is a deeper groan that has been part of the human experience for eons. A friend of mine, Tracy Wright, articulated it like this, that this global pandemic has actually been a light that has shone on the injustices and the heinous crimes that we live and place on each other every single day. The wounds of racism, the persistent, that are persistent and alive in every aspect of our lives. The wounds of gender-based violence that are viciously enacted upon the lives of women's bodies in the main, but also on the lives of the LGBTIA community. The ways in which adult anger and adult uh, hubris has been enacted upon the bodies of innocent young children. These wounds, these dehumanizing cycles of abuse live in a network of poverty and alienation that have become a part of the way in which our world is structured. This woundedness has been a part of the cry of the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, buried in the midst of the greater griefs that we have cried. And sometimes we fall silent or we silence these voices. Perhaps this is one of the most tragic aspects of the pandemic. Amidst the cries of corruption and the inequity that is visible in the handout of vaccines, perhaps it's the silencing of the victims of humanity's greatest crimes to humanity that is the loudest. So many people live in the bowels of abuse. So many people are reduced to nothing every single day. The greatest tragedy of this pandemic is how we have come to witness how these cries are ignored and silenced and nothinged. How people's pain is reduced to statistics, to voices that are loosely behind hashtags. How they become fodder for popular debates on our social media platforms and on public debate spaces. Why? Because we have no answers to the cries of abuse. We have no answers to the network of racism. We have no answers to the cries of poverty and how they are all intermingled and how they all fill the, 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 the great hole in human society. Now, here, I need to draw on black theology and, the the and womanist theology to unpack what the message of the cross holds for us. So out of nothing, every year around this time, we journey with Jesus. We journey with Jesus into Jerusalem, and then we journey with Jesus in Jerusalem on the journey of the cross, the Via Della Rosa to Golgotha. Every year, built into the very fabric of what makes us church, is this ritual. And we walk with Jesus into the very pandemic landscapes of our world and of humanity's story. Every year, we walk the path of what it means to be nothinged, what it means to be dehumanized, what it means to be abused, what it means to be oppressed, and to have the very dignity that God has given us stripped away. We walk it. 
But for most of us, however, this is about our favorite hymns and our favorite religious rituals um, that are kind of lived out on cyclic platforms of personal sin, guilt, and shame. To which God's answer is always this, the cross. It's always forgiveness. It's always renewal. Now, while this is a really good understanding of the work of uh, substitution, where God in Jesus takes our place on the cross, uh, so that we can, through God's act of grace, stand in God's presence as a child of God, while this is a good understanding of what the work of the cross is, it is incomplete. There is another perspective to the work of the cross. And the work of the cross is recreating. Hence my term, out of nothing. Ex nilo. When God, the ground of all being, when God, who is the very movement of love and life, chooses to enter time and space, God meets us in Jesus, the Christ, in a baby born in scandal, in a baby born in the midst of ethnic cleansing, in a baby who had to flee as a refugee. God becomes flesh in the body of a human being that lives in a homeland that is occupied under foreign military occupation. God becomes a body that is policed and censored and dehumanized. God becomes flesh in the bodies that are nothinged. This is not a casual act of coincidence, but a deliberate act of incarnation. When God, the ground of all being, chooses to enter time and space, God puts on bone, flesh, and sinew in the shape of the oppressed, in the shape of the abused. It comes to a head as we enter Jerusalem and the cross. For in this moment, as we journey with God's body, with the Christ, with Jesus, into Jerusalem and into the way of the cross, we interact intimately with the body of God. We interact intimately with the religious leaders who sell out the body of God. We interact intimately with the political readers who expediently wash their hands off the body of God. We interact with the misogyny that is lived in the body when the body is commodified and gambled over by Roman soldiers. We see face to face what toxic masculinity does to the human body in the language of the empire. We interact with race, with ethnicity, with ethnicity, with brokenness, with the fragility of the human story, which we only very rarely give our ears time to listen to. So what can we take away in this moment of nothingness? In this moment of nothingness, God in Jesus articulates the great cry that is articulated by all people who feel so nothinged. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is the cry of people who live in the long eternal Good Friday. It is the cry of the people who live in the pandemic landscapes of abuse and oppression in the world. And it is the cry of God. So what do we hear when we walk with Jesus in the way of the cross? I want to give three things, and it comes directly out of the traditions of black theology, borrowing a lot from people like James Cone and from uh, Katie Cannon. So none of these ideas are original but they come from the story and the experience of the people who have lived the life of oppression and abuse. We know that from the stories of creation, God creates out of nothing. 
that God's spirit hovers over the chaos and the nothingness and calls forth life and love. In the same way, in this moment, the cross is God's hovering presence over the chaos of our consistent dehumanization. And so the first truth that the cross gives us is comfort. And the comfort is for those who are on the underside of history, for the marginalized, for the oppressed and the abused. When God puts on God's flesh, God enters intimately into the story of what it means to be abused. When God does this, God identifies, God walks, God becomes the body that is broken. Now this means that more than just being a victim, God incarnates that moment. And with that incarnation comes the title, Child of God. For when God puts on flesh and bone and sinew and embodies the story that the abused know, the title that they walk away with, that we walk away with, is not a result or resultant of the abuse, but rather a child of God whom God has chosen. The second thing that the cross echoes to us <clears throat> is challenge. And whereas most of us read the cross as a moment of personal piety, a moment where we see our sins etched out on the body of Christ, the moment when we understand the substitutionary atonement of the cross, what it really is is a challenge. For it's on the cross that we see the result of what it means to be stuck in cycles of such vicious violence that we inflict on each other time and time and time and time again. We see the result of what it means to be abused, of what it means to be hurt, of what it means to be dehumanized and nothinged. We recognize our own complacency and complicity in the actions that violence the world. More intimately though, we see how religion is intertwined in it. We see how politics is intertwined with it. We see how the military machine is intertwined with it. We see how governance undergirds it and holds it together. And we begin to recognize that our own comfort is written into the very fabric of the actions of abuse. The only option left is our silence and our turning around, our metanoia and our repentance. The third word from the cross is recreation. Because out of the cross, there comes a moment when we begin to recognize that death is not the final word. That out of this aching silence, love and life burst forth. That what is there, what God places within humanity and what God places within the world cannot be silenced or taken away. And that is a movement towards love and towards life if we have the courage to hold it. But the devil is in the detail. Because what does it mean for us as we walk the cross time and time and time again? What does it mean for us who live in the religious ritual of this moment? How do we carry the message of the cross now? I want to leave with you a few thoughts. In this pandemic landscape of abuse, in this pandemic landscape of chronic racism, in this pandemic landscape of our addiction to capitalist comfort at the expense of other people's lives, we as the body of Christ, the body of the ones who are oppressed, need to offer hospitality to the very bodies we are bodied for. 
We need to create space for the people who are hurt. In our meetings, in our conversations about how our church functions and how our denominations use money, we need to be centering the hurt of the people, our hurt. We need to be creating liturgies that create space for gender inclusivity, liturgies that give God talk language outside of toxic patriarchy. And yes, it takes courage to step away from those liturgical addictions. We need to be honest that abuse lives in our pews, that the lives of children and women and marginalized human beings are placed at the altars of our anger and our hubris here in our churches. We need to be honest about it, and then we need to do something about it. Because we cannot create safe spaces of nurture that mirror God's hospitality to the oppressed if we don't understand and acknowledge how we are complacent and complacent in it. We have to do this. This is the work of carrying the cross. This is the work of the way of the cross. And we have to do it sometimes out of nothing. May God bless you, inspire you, challenge you, comfort you and hold you during your Holy Week walk. And know this, love and life have the final word. Amen. <laughs>